Hey there, cool cats. I'm Johnny P. This is JD. And let me tell you something. You might think you know about what it is to be cool. All right. But obviously looking at us, you don't know Jack. All right. Forget about it. We're going to teach you what it means to be cool and when you can take it too far. Because being cool rules, but don't break the rule of cool on WebDM. One take, mother. Today's episode is brought to you by College Humor Dropouts, Dimension 20, Unsleeping City. Unsleeping City is an actual play series that uses Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition to set up a modern urban fantasy world. The backdrop is New York City, this mystical place which is a boundary between the mundane waking world and the veiled dreaming world of magic. The party slowly uncovers this world that's existed right under their noses and it's a really awesome way to check out a different take on 5th edition and fantasy as well. For more info, go to dropout.tv and use the code ROLL50 for 50% off the first month of your subscription. You also get the first week for free. There you can find all 17 episodes of The Unsleeping City. Link here and in the description. All right, Jim, other than uh, the appropriate sunglasses and attitude, mm. um, where where do you start with the rule of cool? Oh, the rule of cool. This is going to be one of those where I, I don't want to give the impression that I'm a grumpy old man. It's an old neckbeard? Just like, yeah, just I, I don't want anybody to have fun. But I, I feel sort of about the rule of cool as I do about the, um, you know, rules as fun sort of philosophy or, mm -hmm. or fun uh, overall. Uh, other considerations. Yeah, you, you should be having fun. The, the point of playing a game is to have fun, to have an enjoyable mm. experience. Yeah, that's a bold take. It, sure, right? right? And so it seems both a, a shallow kind of analysis and also not a very helpful tool. And I feel similarly about the rule of cool, where it's like, yeah, the point of these things is to have memorable experiences that are in mm. fun and engaging and the like. So on the one hand, like saying, uh, you know, the rule of cool, which is, you know, allowing certain actions or allowing the attempt of certain actions because it's awesome or adds to the scene or something is kind of like, well, what, you're not doing that already? Like, what, did, we, did we need one of these uh, mnemonics, <laughs> you know, to help us remember this? Because it's sort of a pithy phrase and saying, it also rhymes. And it also rhymes. A lot of people will just sort of like take what should be just a guideline, a thing to keep in mind, a spice for their gaming and make it the main dish every time, all the time. And that leads to you know problems in their games. Oh yeah, it is it is the difference between sprinkling a little cinnamon on top of the cinnamon roll right. and eating all the cinnamon. We've seen how that plays out online. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, that's, that's a perfect analogy, Jim. I was gonna use like, Sriracha or something, but no. cinnamon works too, I guess. No. <laughs> the D and D cinnamon challenge. In in a nutshell, uh, the rule of cool is basically saying uh, that you uh, that as a dungeon master, uh, you allow the chance to attempt or perform these ridiculous stunts uh, or a bending of the rules in order to enhance uh, the scene that they're in, to to provide an awesome spotlight moment uh, for that character. Uh, and, and, and all other kinds of general reasons. That's just sort of the general definition of it. I kind of extend it to character creation as well, because mm -hmm. I see a lot of the, just like, I want to try this concept just because it's cool or interesting, even if it's not necessarily uh, in the rules. I think that's fine, like, yeah, you I know, mean, there, there's... There are rules for changing subclasses and, certainly. and character abilities, or at least, you know, uh, Switching ideas, them around. Switching them around. Make, yeah, customizing like them. Yeah. Um, and it's like, I, on the one hand, I think of it, and I can think of some of the the more common uses of this uh, this philosophy, this sort of like you know a, a mindset for refereeing a game, mm -hmm. there's things like off-label uses of spells, right? Like how often is the, you have a player who just you know they they've got a spell that kind of does what they want, but not really. They want to try something with it or use it in a creative way that's part of its prescribed uh, effects. Like those are things that you might yeah, uh, yeah. allow, or like parkour type stunts where you're just leaping from you know rooftop alley to awning to to ledge, and you're really making use of your environment in your movement. Most of them though sort of involve some kind of improbable or implausible stunt or plan. Almost always, I find that it's it's when um, the players feel maybe like they're overwhelmed or like they're facing like really bad odds. Uh, a lot of times these plans can come from over planning, from just like the players, you know, taking too much time to concoct some bizarre contraption, you know, of a scheme, some sort of Rube Goldberg uh, device mm -hmm. uh, of a plan and then convince themselves of its efficacy 
and then maybe balk whenever the DM's like, yeah, that's not gonna work, or that's not plausible, or what about this, that, and the other? And you get in these moments where there's five, four or five people arguing for their kind of wacky shenanigans versus a dungeon master kind of going like, well, I, you know, I don't know about that. And so you, you... Yeah, it's just four kobolds in a room, guys. <laughs> <You know. laughs> or I just don't know that they're going to fall for that. Or, or, you know, maybe the players are assuming certain things about the NPCs, how they'll react or act, or assuming certain things about the environment that they don't know. And they never stop to consider whether their assumptions about the situation are correct. Yeah. And then you get into kind of a, well, we assumed it was like this situate you know and and you know why isn't it yeah um, and if you don't know the saying about assumptions that is one of the biggest things is is the players generally and i i've been guilty of this oh certainly you're like yeah. oh they're goblins they're dumb they'll fall for they'll it. fall for and it it's they'll like this, well maybe not yeah. maybe the one road scholar in there who's pissed off because he has to stay here on guard duty instead of going and studying at the library knows exactly that that illusion that you're going to throw at them is complete <laughs> bullshit and he's like guys that's dumb the wacky plans i think are the ones where it really falls into problems for mm -hmm. the group. The other stuff, all flavor uses of spells, parkour like movement stunts, and, and just like improbable, not impossible, right? We're not talking yeah. about things that are flat out, you cannot do them, but just like, uh, it's yeah. an edge case. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, this is d and I mean, a few things are impossible. Oh, certainly, right. There are a few things that should be a flat out impossible. It's yeah. DC 30 check, come on. We yeah. passed that in no time. I, I think that the rule of cool as both a referee philosophy and a uh, just a guiding principle really comes out of that antagonistic DMing style that 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 we kind of grew up with in the late 90s and, and into mm -hmm. the 2000s where doing anything other than the prescribed actions that were available to your character, trying to do anything that was just like, I, I'm not gonna think about this as a game with moves I can make, but as an environment my, my avatar exists in. Yeah, and I'm just gonna try whatever, gonna describe whatever I want. Uh, to the uh, to the DM, and for a long time, you know, you'd be you would have impossible tasks set in front of you for it, right? Like mm -hmm. you've got a you know the the amount of roles that you have to make and the difficulty uh, that they represent seems you know excessive, or that there are a variety of conditions that you have to arrive at first in order to just you know please the DM, and so it kind of became this situation where if you do anything other than say I attack, you get um, you know, you, you just have to go this round after round after round of arguing with the DM to just be like, let you even attempt the thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think the rule of cool arises out of too many people experiencing that, too many arguments that are that are really over nothing. And, and it begins with a philosophy of just like, either say yes or let them roll the dice. You know, like there's a lot of games out there that have that, that kind of uh, philosophy. Either let them do it or let them attempt it and give them a, a difficulty class. And a few years ago, Matt Mercer writes, you know, the rule of cool and sort of some guidelines for it on Geek and Sundry's uh, GM tips. And like, that's when I really started seeing an articulation of this philosophy as a, you know, that had a name, that had a phrase that you could go along with and that both players could use as a shield for their shenanigans <laughs> and that dms can be like oh yeah i use the rule of cool when i'm playing and then when you play with them you're just kind of like well, we're not really playing a game we're just sort of playing pretend where we describe really awesome scenes at each other and like that's not a terrible time <laughs> but it's not like what i personally want out of out of the game so i, I have a love-hate relationship with the rule of cool because I, I like i agree with it philosophically i agree with mm -hmm. sort of where it comes from say yes or roll the dice uh, kind of attitude, but I, it is not something that I use all the time. It's just a an, an attitude that I try to keep in mind mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to like always say yes. And we kind of started touching on some of the, the limitations of oh, it. Sure. When you have new players, yeah, a lot of times is when you when you have like you know, and, and the thing is is that's good because it's a different um, mindset, it's a different mentality coming into it. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of outside the box thinking. A lot of times when you're playing with new players, they can come up with great ideas as to way to uh, to either very much defeat yeah. challenges or circumvent them out, Easy, outright. Yeah. Um, but also uh, sometimes it's like they don't understand the action economy. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. Now when it's players that do know the action economy and they know what player that characters can do, and then they're like, "I want to do this," and you know, it's like, 
Yeah, yeah. That's, that's more than just one. <laughs> you, you know that, right? I mean, because sometimes it's player abuse. Sometimes it's just player ignorance. You know, ignorance, not in a, that's not a bad word. It's just, it's just absence a, yeah, of knowledge. Certainly. Right. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that can kind of be, but that, that can lend itself to a problem. Right. I mean, if you if you allow that too much, if you allow that too much, uh, I, I think one of the biggest problems with uh, with overuse of the rule of cool, and it's sort of like overused by players and then referees and dungeon masters who are, are kind of like just like lax on either their understanding of the rules, and so they feel like they can rely on uh, more like rule of cool style rulings to referee their game, and maybe the group doesn't care. You know, mm -hmm. maybe they don't care, but it's one of those things where if members of that group go and start playing with other groups and, and the like, that you will start running into issues. So for me... Well, my other DM <laughs> lets me do that. Right, my other DM <laughs> lets me do that. You know, yeah. and, and sometimes that's okay to bring up. You might say like, hey, my, my understanding is that for these kind of skill roles, I'm rolling investigation. You know, I didn't realize it would be perception would cover this. Can I change it? You know, like that's one of those things where you sort of conform in some part to the table you're playing with. But it's also why you sit down at the beginning of a game and go like, listen, these are my expectations. Well, let's hear everybody's expectations for what they want out of the game. Um, this could be in a session zero, it could be when you pitch the game, yeah, it could yeah. be whatever, you know. So you're establishing sort of like a tonal floor. <laughs> you know, these are the boundaries of what we consider acceptable actions and acceptable behavior. That can help with some of the wackiness that you might see, just some of the mm -hmm. implausibility of the Looney Tune shit <laughs> that sometimes they get up to. It's also a good way of just like setting expectations and establishing that we can talk about these things. I think maybe the primary thing that I see with, with instances of overuse of the rule of cool is a misunderstanding on the dungeon master's part and therefore the player's part, especially if they're all new, when to roll, what roll to make, and how to set the DCs for those roles. It's one of those things where if you're if you're not thinking about it, if you're not reading the DMG, you're not perusing it uh, and, and just sort of picking topics out of it that you think are going to be useful, if you don't have a solid understanding of the rules and you don't need to know them inside and out before you start playing, you learn as you go. But if after a while you haven't you've have internalized the fact that there is a set path of DCs in, in at least 5th edition, and most RPGs have them, a you know, scale of DCs, if you haven't internalized that, if you haven't read through the sections that are like, when do you make an ability check? When do you add your proficiency bonus to that ability check? What are you actually doing in those situations? Like, how do you, um, say, fail forward, recover from failure? A lot of times you'll just hear that you should do that. There's not a lot of examples of it. Mm -hmm. So there's all these like fuzziness and sort of ambiguity, especially around the skill system of fifth edition and, and what it can and can't do. Now, as a veteran player in DM, I, I see that kind of as a strength because it allows me to mold that system into exactly what I want. Yeah. But it also means that for newer players, they need a lot more guidance. If you're just like, you don't know what's going on with the skill system, you might revert to, yeah, tell me what you do. Oh, that sounds great, you know, and oh, that's an awesome. And you get caught up in the moment. Everybody else at the table is like, holy crap, what a great description or whatever. And then you just either let go with it. And you don't really have them roll or, or mm -hmm. anything like that or you give them like you know so many bonuses and like that uh you know it doesn't really matter if they roll or not it's it's more of a theater formality mm -hmm. you know? or well the roll is just to stick the landing so. sure yeah yeah you do the thing but you fall on your ass and it, it was cool you <coughs> right, accomplished right. your task yes yeah but you told you turned your ankle some other potential issues are just the slippery slope of shenanigans Oh God, yes. That, that <laughs> particularly if you have a DM who doesn't want to rock the boat, they don't want to tell the players no, they're worried about you know their players walking out of their game or upsetting their friends uh, or, or something, then the slippery slope of just wackiness of, of all right, we're gonna go in there, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna slap the count in the face, and we're gonna just bully them around and get what we want. And you do a major illusion of a pie. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, you know, there's magic involved and all this other stuff. And a lot of it seems to mean to be like the players are, pro you know, they're not approaching this from a in-character role-playing perspective. They're not, you know, actors pretending to be their characters. They're more, you know, just want to do wacky, fun stuff. And the DM's over there wanting, you know, they, they want deep immersion, you know, everybody's, you know, you can read that lore packet I sent you, and you mm -hmm. can't treat the count that way. Didn't you know that the war of whatever was started by a slap in the face? You know, just yeah. those kinds of things where it's mismatched expectations, mismatched, you know, 
what you want out of the game. Yeah, it can yeah. be frustrating. <laughs> oh no, no. When 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 you want to play Star Trek and the players want to play Futurama. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Or one player wants to. One or player some wants of them. To. You know, it's really bad when the players are split in this, and yeah. you have one or two players who want to do wacky shenanigans, and the others want to take this really seriously. Good luck on salvaging that, <laughs> but it mm -hmm. requires you to talk uh, to everybody openly. What about Mother May I DMing? Like, have you ever encountered that where you're just like you have to get extreme permission for everything that you want to do like you know I mean, what i mean i mean not not really like early on i was such a new player that i didn't really i mean i did try some crazy stuff but uh -huh. i always tried to keep it within the bounds i mean i at least understood what you could do in a round sure which sure. is i usually <clears throat> find the biggest problem yeah like, I want to run up the ladder and then jump over, grab the oh, yeah. rope, and swing down, and then come down with my dagger on things. Like, well, okay, that's two hundred feet, so yeah. it's going to be three rounds of movement. Uh -huh. You uh -huh. know, like that's mostly that I've. You know, I mean, that's easily one of the number ones that I've, that I've mentioned is that uh, their plans but, just don't fit in a round. But no, I've never really had like the you know where you literally have to ask for. You know, is it okay if I take a right here? And I, I've seen it once or twice as a DM where like I'm clearly dealing with players from other games who are used to different DMs, instead of saying like, okay, as we're walking down the corridor, my character does X, Y, Z. You know, they, they start unspooling a ball of twine so that they will have, a, you know, they'll know how to get out of the dungeon. You know, and every few, whatever, they just make sure they put a rock on top of it to, to stays in one place. Whereas these sorts of players will say, can I do X, Y, Z? Just adds a little bit extra to the game. Mm -hmm. And it, it, as a DM myself, I try to discourage it because it's like, listen, there's some things you don't need to ask my permission for. Things yeah. that your characters just do that yeah. don't affect anything in the outside world, you just tell me that they do them. Yeah. And and when you ask for permission for it, it's number one, it's adding just that extra little step and over the course of a whole game session, if we're constantly having to go back through this where you describe it and ask if you can and then I feel, and then because it's a, it looks like a typical DM player interaction, I'm like, oh yeah, you do this thing, and then repeat it back to you. We've now added a bunch of time and words and, and mm -hmm. the like, and it might not seem like much, but over a session or two, it'll, it'll add up. What I like to do is just let that player know like, hey, there's all kinds of things you can do without my permission. If you have something that you are uncertain of the uh, effect of it or the success of it, that is when we will roll. You just tell me what you want to do then, mm -hmm. but otherwise just, yeah, what are you doing? Like, you don't, you never have to ask permission to just describe what your character's doing. Yeah. But if you play in a game where the dungeon master doesn't understand the rules very well, they're making a lot of rulings, and you're you're also playing with people who are like describing everything, and you're trying a lot of different stuff that that is not covered by the base rules. Nothing wrong with any of that. It could be a very fun experience, but it it will <laughs> shape your expectations of the game. If you go and play with other people who don't play like that, uh, and you're not aware of it, it'll it can create problems. You should always be fostering uh, uh, an environment of players feeling that they have agency. Yes. In, in yeah. Almost every aspect of their character. Yeah. Like you said, it's only it, it's only at the very extremes. Yeah. Bumping up against the world, should there be uncertainty? Sure. And and this is a weird paradox, right? Because the rule of cool is there to support player agency. It's yeah. there to support. The player going like, I don't want to do this pre-determined you know, determined list of options. I want to try something different. I want to, I want to attempt to do something amazing. Yeah. You know, and, and in a lot of ways, they are, it's the player who's making these decisions for the character, which seems obvious, but that's not always how you make decisions for your character, right? Mm -hmm. no, um, my, my, play, my character <laughs> plays me, man. <laughs> Yeah, I sit down, but uh -huh. my character plays. It's that deep, uh, yeah. that deep immersion. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> Daniel Day, Daniel Day Lewis of role playing right. over here he sits over here whittling the entire session. I don't even know what Cheetos are. Those don't exist in my world. It's a a matter of expectations and a matter of of what uh, you know as a dungeon master where you're willing to say like, no, this is not. This crosses a line mm -hmm. uh, for me, but also as a player knowing where that line is and not trying to push over it all the time. Yeah, because you don't want to say yes too often. Well, you, you don't, right? Like, if you do, it can undermine, like, the, the internal consistency of your game. And you would have to be playing with people who were 100% on the same page as you in terms of what you wanted for the setting and what they wanted for the setting and the game and everything. Mm -hmm. And I find that that's rarely the case. And it doesn't need to be. That's why... For instance, when you sit down, you know, to prep things, we always say, like, leave blank spaces on your map. 
we're, we're telling you, like, don't fill in every little detail so you're leaving room for the players to fill them in or you're leaving room for them to, to you know, impact and, and shape the game both as a setting and as it's uh, played. Consistent tone's very important, and I think it's important for a lot of people, and mm -hmm. it's everybody's job to make sure that tone is uh, consistent. Tone is, is important uh, mm -hmm. for, for consistency, like you said, but what are, what are some other like guidelines to think about when Certainly. considering the rule of cool? We don't want people to think that they shouldn't be keeping this in mind, because yeah. the rule of cool, I think, exists to correct a much worse problem, <laughs> right? And it is the overly restrictive... Yeah. You can um, only do these six things. Uh -huh. It's my fun or no fun yeah. kind of uh, style of DMing, which I, it's been a long time since I've seen, but is a real thing. Yeah. And so it, it's what I see when I go to a place like, say, Reddit and, and read what people are saying about Rule of Cool or just problems with it is that it's dungeon masters who either feel like they can't say no uh, because they've been told rule of cool, say yes, yes and, this, that, and the other, player agency, this, that. And it, that advice has either been pr presented to them uncritically and in a way that's not very nuanced. They don't really internalize the nuance of it. And so they think it's like, we gotta do this every time. We gotta do this every time. Now their game's out of control. It's nothing like they wanted it. The players are just running all over the place. They feel like they don't need to roll to succeed on certain things if they have these awesome descriptions and the DM isn't having a good time because the enjoyment for them, the uncertainty, being able to say sort of what happens in the world or, or, or portraying the world is not the same. Mm -hmm. If you have players who just are used to, you know, like, oh, I jump off this thing and land like this and, you know, it gives me, you know, what do you mean? I can't instantly kill the bad guy this way because, you know, that's just the way it's supposed to be. When you're considering all of that, the action economy, as you've mentioned, Pruitt, is, is to me a big one. Mm -hmm. is what they are describing to do something they could actually do in this round, you know, assuming it's combat. Yeah. Um, and that's a pretty, pretty easy one, although I do find that new players do have trouble with the action economy, mm -hmm. that there's something about thinking in terms of, like, I can do set number of actions around. I don't know if there's a different way to present it, you know. Uh, you, know you know, there's just, like, you know, everything costs a certain number of points and you have X number of points per round. I don't know. That's a whole other system. It might take a while for the players to understand that this is the limits of what you can do on your turn. Go ahead and describe what you want to do. And if it's too much, we'll just let you know, you know, but bearing in mind as the dungeon master that like your players might not have a grasp of what's possible with the action economy. And they may very well be trying to say like, I don't want to have to worry about the action economy. If I like describe this really awesome thing and everybody loves it, can I just do it? My answer to that is no, because then we're not playing a game. And I'm here to play a game, not just tell each other cool stories. So action economy is a big one. The other one is uh, resource expenditure. You know, should there be any resources expended in this? If it's an off-label use of a spell, then they might still, they're still going to have to spend the spell slot. And 5th edition already... Um, establishes that spending higher level spell slots can do different effects for certain spells. So that's kind of where my guideline <clears throat> begins with that. You know, it's like, all right, uh, you know, fourth or fifth level version of this spell does something better. Well, they don't have fourth or fifth uh, level spell slot to do that. I mean, give me all your thirds. <laughs> you know, you can do it, but it's going to take like three third level spell slots or something instead yeah. of just the normal one. It might be that, yeah, you can pull off that badass attack maneuver and, and jump around and, and get an advantageous position, but you've like pushed yourself and you've got less hit die than you would before. Take, give me one hit die and you can do that thing. Yeah. Um, and, and it's also possible from the player's side to lead with, will you let me do this in exchange for this expenditure of a resource and mm -hmm. when I'm a player and I want to do something crazy I just try to make sure like hey I'm willing to pay something for this you got to open up negotiations yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can say like right, yeah I'll, I'll give you some hit dice I'll give you some spell slots uh, I'll, I'll sacrifice a piece of equipment I will um, you know use one of my uh, short or long rest abilities probably a long rest ability like, like come on really give yourself a disadvantage here but the point is to acknowledge from a player side that what you are asking for bends or breaks the rules it's a special occasion a special circumstance yeah and that, that might necessitate necessitate you doing something uh, to to pay for that um, the, the sort of related to that is anytime any of these you know actions or descriptions or whatever starts becoming the standard procedure 
or starts becoming the thing that you do every time you're in the situation, that is, uh, for me, as a dungeon master, the point at which I go, it doesn't work anymore. Like, you know, you can do the a stunt like once or twice because it's like this special moment and you pull it off. But, you know, no. If, if you really want to keep doing that thing, ride it up as a feat and take it as one of your, <laughs> you know, your well, feats. Yeah, that I was going to say, because it, it certainly sounds like uh, the way, like an Exalted, yeah. you would have certain stunts that you would do so, ever so often and they'd cost you a lot more and then the more you mm -hmm. did them then it can become a maneuver that you do sure uh, sure maybe just make a combo off uh, you know yeah. out of those and have it there yeah that's the other thing is like a, a system like exalted has stunting descriptions of wacky cool off the wall oh my god uh mm -hmm. things all over the place and um you know it's it's a fun for it uh, it adds something to it but yeah, mo it's mostly dice to a pool. Mostly dice to a pool, but it's also like a place where those kinds of things have an insetting logic and yeah. reason. Some other things to consider as you're, uh, you know, when you're presented with these sort of wacky, off the wall plans or or things that the players are trying to argue rule cool for, would be, you know, is the action even possible or viable uh, mm -hmm. by the internal logic of the setting and by the, you know, the actual rules of the game, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think, you know, that's helpful to a lot of people just, you know, can this even be attempted? If the answer is no, then no. Yeah, you, yeah. yeah, it's one thing to be, to kind of bend the laws, but to, to outright, you know, fly in the face of logic. That, I mean, Certainly, that, yeah. that, that, that suspends, dis, that breaks disbelief, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, And that's the thing is we're all kind of suspending disbelief to enjoy this game together. Yes. Um, but yeah. I think also another thing is how on theme with that player is that action? Like if you're, the wizard who usually stays in the back, but then you want to do a crazy like, I want to run up here and jump over the thing as I'm casting a spell. It's just like, that doesn't, like I'm less inclined to accept that if it doesn't really make sense yeah. with the, the logic of your theme. If it's like a desperate situation, they're acting out of, out of their typical you know, behavior because it's desperate, like that's one thing, but it's also like you're saying where it's like, this really just seems like you're trying to get an advantage is not necessarily flowing from your character. Yeah. And and you just sort of want to do this thing because, I, you know, and that's a moment where I might ask the player, like, what are, what are you trying to accomplish with this? Mm -hmm. You know, like, what it, this seems like it's out of character for you, for your character, like, can you help me, can you help me get to where you're at? Is usually what I will say. Once that attempt has been made, I'm still unsatisfied, I'm just like, uh, I'm not sure. Then we can negotiate from there, but, I'm at least give you a chance to convince me. Be like, all right, this seems this seems different. It doesn't seem like what your character usually does. Convince me of why this is the moment they have decided to change. It is a good guideline. I like that because it's like, yeah, come on, you're really like really gonna try to do this? Like you've been a coward this whole time. Yeah. Where's this coming from? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, it, you know, if there's a if there's a series of events that have led to them like trying to find that nugget of courage within them, and this is the moment where it breaks out. Yeah. Well, that's one thing because you're kind of flowing with the story. Right. And I would be more inclined in that moment to allow you to do something crazy and courageous if yeah. you have been trying to work towards that. Sure. Sure. Right? sure. Yeah. And so uh, staying within what your you know what your what your character is. is is on an arc four, yeah. Uh, but maybe you just want to boost it a little bit. It's a little bit different than just pulling a one eighty and just like, oh come on, it'll be cool, right? It'll be cool, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. Hey, I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But... I can see that. I can see that. So I, I, you know, when I play, I make a lot of decisions in what would be called author stance. You know, I don't, I don't like to think about my. I don't like to get into character. I just don't uh, it's not really what I enjoy about it and so I like to look at my character from from sort of a, a bit of a removed uh, perspective and to say like well I want this to happen for them because I think this would be an interesting situation for them to find themselves in and I might say well someone you know my my character wouldn't do this because this is how they think or this is you know where their priorities are mm -hmm. I try to like talk through those things when I um, attempting something different or weird or that's not a prescribed action right. to the dungeon master so that they can have an insight into where I'm coming from. You know, that they can understand Jim is not doing this to just power game the system, although if it happens to benefit, 
Uh, <laughs> you know, they're not doing this, you know, just because they're bored or trying to derail things or they don't misunderstand the situation. You know, you by anticipating DM's confusion and saying, like, this is where I'm coming from, this is why I want to do this, this is what I hope to accomplish, mm -hmm. the dungeon master can then jump right to the end and go, all right, roll this die mm -hmm. and, and, and see what happens. Which kind of brings me to my final uh, guideline is a lot of the times when players attempt these things, they are attempting them to get out of rolling the dice. That okay. they want to set, they want to describe everything that's happening, uh, in, you know, in such a way that you are impressed enough to to not have to do it. Not always, right? Sometimes they're doing it just for the fun of it, but sometimes that's what's happening. And I would say with any of these things, to make someone roll. A die <laughs> you know it could be a skill challenge type thing where you are uh, you know it's multiple die rolls before three failures or it can just be a one-off you know make this check once yeah and having some element of uncertainty which means it needs to be possible for them to fail this thing it needs to be possible for them to humiliate themselves to not stick the landing to blow it entirely which means that you need to have an understanding of what the DCs for your particular game are. Or if it's 5th edition, understand that they run the gamut from 5 to 30 in 5 uh, you know, numeral increments. Um, and that anyone with expertise will blow those numbers out of the water. <laughs> you have to consider that. You have to think about, is the DC, the difficulty class of this uh, check that I'm setting, appropriate? Can they even fail it? What's their chance to fail it? Mm -hmm. And all of that might sound like a lot. The more you do it, the easier it'll get. And uh, just keeping in mind that, that the rule of cool is a tool. Therefore, it, is, uh, it has its proper use, proper place. And uh, it's really awesome when, it's, when it works, you know. We're not overusing it. Right but, at the end here, what are some examples, either as a player or as a DM? Mostly, I want to I wanna see how much I've pissed you off over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Taking notes. <laughs> Some examples of the rule of cool from like of yeah. what uh... in your game, like when players presented like some kind of crazy. Sh I have a couple of examples, all from one player. Yeah, and yeah. if he's watching, he knows who, <laughs> who I'm, a, I'm about to talk about. Him. It's been a long time since I've, I've, I, I, you know, since I've run across like the really crazy plans. Mm -hmm. I think the ones that I would that I would run into the most are when there's an attempt to infiltrate somewhere, you know, like a heist situation, and and so you're sort of like. You're listening to the plans, and at some point, the players will cross a line from that was enough to what do you guys do. You know, like we need to cover this angle and that angle and this contingency and that contingency, and and over planning on players' part is a uh, is a problem. You know, it can bog down a game and slow things down. But like usually, that's where I would find one of those. Just like you guys want to do what? <laughs> like the less physical challenges I move away from, like say dungeon obstacles or um, you know, more traditional type uh, monster hunting adventures, that the less these things crop up, you know, like there's less of like situations where the party is scratching their heads going like, what in the world do we do about this thing? And if it involves more people that they're having to interact with, um, then I find that they just engage in that sort of behavior less because it's like, there is an acknowledgement that like, well, we don't really know how the NPC is going to interact or something. I don't mind it. I, I have no problem saying like, hey, this is implausible. It's not going to work. Or yeah, you just got to roll a 32. You know, sure, there's that's the DC. Can you get it? Mm -hmm. um, or or, or the, the thing that I, that I struggle with the most and that I constantly try to seek to improve on is like either success with complication, because um, that's the other thing with, with these sorts of uh, you know, moments in gaming is that if you're talking about a system like D&D, &D, you know, a system like D&D &D is you meet the DC or you don't. There's not a gradiated, uh, you know, scale of success. Yeah. And so I try to think of things like uh, DC plus five, DC plus 10 as being benchmarks for how well something's uh, succeeded and then basing my description or, or sort of like what the consequences for the action are on that. Mm -hmm. um, is how I'll, I'll kind of guide that. But gosh, it's been so long since I've had someone be like, I want to just do this weird, wacky thing. Not because I don't have creative players, but like they usually try to do things that I don't need to make those kind of calls on. Yeah. And they either, it's either like they're using their skills and sort of like incorporating that or they're, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're just not 
attempting those kind of weird things. I don't have that problem. No, you don't. In that I have a, a player, uh, his name's Greg, and he's, <laughs> he's one of the best role players I've ever played with. But the thing is, is he constantly, like, and this is what I know, is like, all right, Pruitt, Take this journey with me. Yeah, and I'm like, right, yeah, and yeah, I'm like, yeah, all right, here okay. we go. Yep. Mm -hmm. And a couple of instances, and it's always like, just kind of like, for him, it's it's really just like off book spell uses. Like yeah. Just kind of interesting ways to use spells yeah. that aren't really like first instance, second episode of Starbound ever. They're on a ship on a Neogi uh, Death Spider, and as a as a punishment, um, the Neogi has dropped the prisoners that it was holding his leverage in the cargo hold out. Yeah. To try to distract the players We're like that. Ah, well, you keep coming after me, boom. Yeah. These things fall out. So he jumps over the edge because he knows he has feather fall. Yeah. But he wants to do an Iron Man three and gather everyone together within range first uh -huh. before he casts it. So he wants to use his mage hand. Well, by the rules, you can only move mage hand twenty feet, and I believe right. terminal velocity is one hundred twenty-five miles an hour. Something so, like that. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that translates was, into feet per round. Yeah. So it becomes a thing of just like you know, you cast it at a point versus relative to you. Is right. The thing. Right. Right. He was like, well, can it be real? And so I just was like, all right, well, and I think I just had him make an arcana check, and it was yeah. just a way to cast the spell in a slightly different way. In few, like now, I would have, I should, what I should have done is made him use a, like a slot, like a first level slot to cast a cantrip mm -hmm. to basically like have more hold. Oh, certainly, on it, yeah, right? yeah, that's another um, way to do it. Yeah. And so uh, now later on, uh, so I let him do it. But he he made the roll, and so I'm like, all right, so. It's within your range. It's relative to your fall velocity, and you can move it around twenty feet and do, and basically do the thing, yeah. which is, which was just kind of help nudge people uh, in the air, you know, because it's like a ten pound telekinesis. Sure, yeah, and yeah. Technically, you are weightless, and yeah. so it's it was. He made the roll, so I let him have his cake and eat it too. Yeah. And then the next one was uh, trying to get out of a ship before it exploded, and using Tensor's floating disc is basically like a net to carry someone as he's catapulted. <laughs> For the disc to bring the person nice. with him, <laughs> and it was it was kind of the same thing where I'm like, okay, you're just kind of changing the orientation yeah. Yeah. of the disc itself, and you're only pulling one person, and it's not like for an extended amount of time. So again, I just had him kind of make an arcana check, which to me was just him casting the spell, but just changing a few words while you're yeah. casting it, yeah. so you get a slightly different thing. And again, he did it, got on a catapult and was just rocking it out, <laughs> and they like got drugged behind him. I think later on I was like, you should just write that up as a different kind yeah, of spell, yeah, and yeah. he did. And well, and that's the thing is like, if especially with off brand use, if yeah. you're going to keep using a spell in a way that's not the way the spell's written, then like, hey, you're, this is spell research, yeah. right? <laughs> you, you know, you. This let's is your just, first test. <laughs> yeah, let's just go ahead and and formalize this process a bit, and you have a new yeah. spell, like you're saying. So, I like that. Shenanigans are why we're playing. Like mm -hmm. shenanigans is what I want. Shenanigans is what I'm here mm -hmm. for. But mm -hmm. it's got to be in the context of the tone of the campaign. It's yeah. got to be in the context of the rules that we have all agreed to use. You know, the older I get and the longer I play the game, the more I'm like, I'm playing a game. I'm, I want to use these rules that were that were written and that and and maybe not the way they were written. I might want to change them. They might yeah. not work for me. But I don't want to just. I don't like things that are hand waved, and I don't like things that rely 100% on just the dungeon master's whim. I, I want there to be. Something. It doesn't have to be super crunchy, but some kind of rule, some kind of mechanical support, because that's what elevates the experience for me from the kind of pretend I did when I was a kid versus the kind of pretending and playing and imagining that I like to do now. Yeah. And so that's that's why you know we get on about the rules and shit. Most definitely. Which are cool in and of themselves. Oh. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons. The Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Web Demons is a proud partner of D&D Beyond, our favorite supplement for our D&D games. We've got a link to them in the description. Go and check them out. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week, and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, Web DM Plays. Thanks for watching. You don't know nothing. Forget about it. Let me tell you something. We're going to tell you how it is to be cool today. When you can take it too far. It's cool to rule, but it's not to fuck up the intro on your second attempt. So we're going to start over on WebDM. <clears throat> God, one more time and I got to get the yeah. fuck out of this thing. Yeah.